Well, hello there. This is Craig Hain. My students call me Dr. Dell. And this video is going to be about uh, STEM math, the whole story. And it's aimed at anybody that thinks they might even be interested in STEM math. Either uh, they might have a student or someone they know. And uh, it's what I'm going to talk about is in this book I've just written called Golden Rule Math for STEM math students. Now, this is book is about 60 some pages long. And there's a chapter in it that's on the whole story of STEM math. And that's what this video is about. Basically, I'm going to tell you that story. It's a rather long story. And if you know anyone or if you're interested in STEM math and in STEM subjects of any kind, physics, engineering, science, whatever, and especially if you think math is a barrier, which it has been traditionally and it no longer is, that this is something you really need to know. Now, in order to, to do this, I'm going to share the screen with you and show you just exactly what this is about. First of all, if you go to goldenrulemath.com, goldenrulemath.com, there are several books you can get there that uh, people will wanna know if they're interested in math in any, at, at all. Now, one of these math, uh, books is for STEM students, and that's the one I'm talking about. And if you click on that, then that'll take you to another page, and you'll have this book for Golden Rule Math for STEM students. What you tell you about it, and there's a video where I explain what's in this book, why you would want to read this book, what you get out of it, and you can go buy it on Amazon. Click here, and that'll take you to Amazon, and you can buy it either paperback or Kindle. But the other thing you can do is you can download a free PDF copy. So if you click on that, uh, that will take you then to a free PDF copy and you can read the book just for free on PDF. Now, this book, Golden Rule Math for STEM students uh, is, is something that I think anybody that has a student that might even potentially be interested in science or engineering should read. And that's particularly true if you have a student that's afraid of math because math is no longer a barrier. And that's what this book's all about. Now, this is a table of contents of the book and it's 65 pages long. And it's a lot of different information about STEM and what you should do. Chapter one is STEM math in a nutshell, four, four pages long. And you can read this book pretty quickly. Now, spike pedagogy is extremely important in terms of how you teach math and how it can be taught today. And that, that's important to learn. But chapter 10, I've got is STEM math, the full story. And that's the longest chapter in this book, it's 16 pages long. And that's what this video is gonna be about. So you can listen to this, you can read the chapter if you like to read things, but you might just wanna to listen to the video. So I'm gonna go down now to page 35, which is where this, um, at least I'm gonna to try to, <laughs> where this chapter is. And I'm going to basically, I'm not gonna read it verbatim to you, but I, I'm basically gonna tell you what's in this chapter. And I'll probably be telling you a few things beyond what's actually written in the chapter. So you can just sit back and listen to it. You don't really need to watch the video uh, because I'm just using this sort of as a, if you want to call it a script and I'm going to blow it up a little bit so that it's easier for, if you do want to read it and watch it. Now this is for any parent or student or teacher for that matter that is interested in any kind of a science or engineering subject. They call that STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, S-T-E-M science and engineering in particular. Now, I point out that this chapter can be challenging if you don't know much math, but I still think you can understand it. I've had some uh, people tell me that don't know very much math that they still pretty much understood what I was telling them. I'm not gonna teach you math now. I'm gonna talk about math education and what you need to know if you have somebody that is interested in, um, in, in STEM, potentially even. Well, first thing I tell you is there's, a, there's two approaches to, to learning and to teaching math. One is called heuristic and one is called rigorous. Now, heuristic just means that you do it in a practical way that anybody can pretty much understand. And that's how our ancestors learned math and taught math for centuries and centuries and centuries. Rigorous is where you try to prove everything. You start with a set of assumptions called axioms and you prove theorems. And that is much, much more difficult to do. It really started with Euclid's elements where he was proving geometry theorems a long time ago. But then when STEM math began to be developed by, and I'll be telling you about that, they used a heuristic approach until modern mathematicians came along and starting in the 1800s, they decided to um, 
to teach it rigorously. And, 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 and that got into some of our textbooks, particularly the more advanced STEM books. And it's very difficult to do it. Now, it's also difficult to teach it rigorously. I've done it both ways, and believe me, teaching it rigorously is a challenge for the teacher and the students. Well, classical mathematicians, like I said, did it heuristically. And that's how I basically teach math is heuristically. Now, there's a wonderful math book that was developed uh, back in the late uh, 20th century called Pre-Calculus Mathematics in a Nutshell. Probably the greatest math teacher of the 20th century, Dr. George Simmons. And I've used his books, Pre-Calculus Mathematics in a Nutshell. And I think anybody, if you're interested in STEM at all, you should buy that book from Amazon. It's about $20, maybe a little bit less. And of course, I say, wonder why it's not adopted by any high schools. I've never seen it adopted by any school, but I've used it to teach many, many students. Now, what I'll tell you about Dr. Simmons, he was a great math teacher. He taught the greatest calculus, wrote the greatest calculus book I've ever seen. He wrote the greatest differential equations book I've ever seen. And then he wrote a very advanced book on what's called topology and modern analysis, which is where I met him. I, I was teaching out of that. That's advanced math for physicists and math, math majors, things like Hilbert spaces and so on that, that are used in quantum theory. And that's how I met him. And then he did these other books. So he's a great math teacher. Now, he also believed in the heuristic approach. And I believe that's what we should be teaching uh, using for our students. And, and, and sometimes that's done today and sometimes it's not. But a lot of the textbooks have a lot of theory in them. It's not heuristic. OK, now the question really is, what do you need? What does a student need to learn? Now, you, so if you know math, this will make sense to you. I still think you'll learn a few things you may didn't know. If you don't know math, just sort of listen to it, listen to the names and, and so on. And I'll give a very brief description. You need to first look about numbers. Now, almost everybody knows about numbers. And they talk about what are called real numbers. Now, all a real number really is, is a number you can express in base 10, decimally speaking. So 345, that's, a, that's an integer. 345.56, that's considered a rational number, a real number. Then there's thing called hyperreal numbers. You probably never heard of them. And I'll tell you a little bit about them later on. And then there's something called complex numbers, very important. Both of these, these three number systems are very important for STEM. And a STEM student's got to be understand all three of them at a heuristic level, not rigorous, heuristically. And that's how I teach them. Now, you may know if you've studied math at all, that if you take a straight line and you assign a, a number line to it, then every point on the line corresponds to what they call a real number. And uh, that's what they call the real number system. Now, you can express a real number as a decimal expansion. And uh, you have subsets of the real numbers on the line. You have natural numbers, the counting numbers. And you have negative numbers then, like the negative of the counting numbers. And you have rational numbers, that's fractions. And uh, those are basically the numbers you need for science and engineering. But it turns out that there are also, among the real numbers, ones that have non-repeating decimal expansions, non-repeating, and those numbers are called irrational. Now that's a purely theoretical idea. In the real world, when you do measurements, there's no such thing as an irrational number. This is something theoretical mathematicians care about, but scientists and engineers don't care about it, or they shouldn't, they don't have to. And in fact, they even divide the irrational numbers into two subsets, algebraic and transcendental. Mathematicians care about that, you don't. And, and, and our science and engineer doesn't, only mathematicians do. Now, sometimes this gets taught, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the book you're using and the teacher and all that, but it shouldn't be taught uh, just getting ready for science and engineering. Then there's something called complex numbers. Now that corresponds to points in the plane, not just a line, but the whole plane. That's very important for science. You absolutely have to understand them. And it's easy to understand them heuristically because it involves trigonometry, and something called infinite series, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And there's a, there's a special equation now for complex numbers called Euler's equation. And Richard Feynman said that it was the greatest equation in mathematics because complex numbers are critical in physics and in science. You can't do uh, electrical engineering. You can't do physics. You can't do a lot of things in science without complex numbers. And they're easy to understand if it's taught properly, very easy to understand it. And indeed, as you're going to find out in other places where I talk about a six tier math program that's available today, they're taught in tier four and, and, and students find it very easy to understand when it's taught properly. Now there's something called hyper real numbers. You probably never heard of that. And 
part of the hyper real number called infinitesimals. Now these are numbers that are non-zero, but they're smaller than any real number. Now our ancestors used these heuristically uh, to do math, to do science math. And uh, the problem was back in the 1800s when mathematicians tried to make it rigorous, they couldn't figure out how to uh, include them. And as you'll find out, I'll tell you in a minute, they, they, they banned them. It turns out in uh, the 20th century, in, in 1966, in fact, mathematicians, theoretical mathematicians, figured out how to put them back in. And so they were back in. Now, let me tell you a little bit of story about how this happened. It's an interesting story. Probably the greatest mathematician of antiquity in the Greeks world was a guy named Archimedes. You've probably heard of Archimedes. Now, let's give you a quick example of something Archimedes did. Euclid and Euclid's Elements, which is the famous geometry book that everybody studied math out of for centuries and centuries. Abraham Lincoln, for example, learned math out of Euclid's Elements. And it proves things about geometry, a lot of proofs, very rigorous. Uh, they define the circumference of a circle divided by the diameter. Those are two numbers. C divided by D is called pi. They give it a name now. It's a Greek letter pi. And you've probably heard of pi, 3.1416 and so on. Okay, Euclid did that. Now, Euclid did not know how to calculate the area of a triangle, I mean, of a circle. He didn't know how to calculate the area of it. It's not in Euclid elements. Archimedes came along and he used a modern approach, kind of like calculus, a precursor to calculus, to actually calculate the area of a circle based on this number pi. In fact, what he did is he proved, heuristically he proved, that if you take the diameter divided by two and multiply that times the circumference divided by two, if you do that, that's the area of a circle. And he proved it heuristically. Now that, that do a little algebra and that becomes pi r squared. You've all heard of pi r squared. Well, Archimedes did it. He did a lot more than that. Uh, he did something with a, with a sphere, a ball, a sphere, in terms of its volume and its area, comparing it to the volume of the area of a cylinder and that was, a, that was his most brilliant achievement. And he won that on his tombstone. And I teach that in tier two, I'll call it Archimedes tombstone. It's very easy to understand heuristically. Okay. Now, in the 1600s, calculus was invented, what we call calculus today. And Newton in England and Leibniz in Germany. And, and, and the way Leibniz did it is the way it's done, it went forward. And Leibniz had a lot of students and one of them was a guy named Euler, Lenhart Euler in the 1700s. And between Leibniz and Euler, they used this concept of infinitesimals to develop calculus. And it's wonderful. And if you go back and read their works, you see the use of these infinitesimals. But what happens, I mentioned earlier, when theoretical mathematicians began to make math rigorous in the 1800s, they couldn't, they didn't know how to include them in an axiomatic number system. They couldn't do it. So what did they do? They banned them. They said, oh, well, since we can't figure out how to do it rigorously, you, you can't use them. Well, that's just pure nonsense. And that created a bifurcation in STEM mathematics. Applied mathematicians and scientists kept using them because they're very useful. You, the best way to understand the concepts of calculus is with infinitesimals. By the way, that's what I use when I teach it heuristically. But the mathematicians managed to get them banned from calculus books. So today, when you study calculus, there's no infinitesimals in the calculus books. And it's much harder. They do it more rigorously. They use what are called epsilon delta limit theorem proofs. Very hard and very difficult. And students very often can't get through calculus. It's a barrier, huge barrier. Well, <coughs> Uh, that was a setback for STEM math education, in my view, starting in the mid uh, 1800s. Well, guess what? In 1966, a great mathematician named Abraham Robinson figured out how to put him back in rigorously in what's called the hyper real number system. That's all rigorous. And that happened to be, in, just coincidentally, the year I got my PhD in algebraic number theory and theoretical math. So when that happened, and that's how I knew about all this, because I've studied math theory. I also knew what the science, what the engineers were doing with infinitesimals, even though they weren't supposed to, but they were doing it. Okay. I thought, whoopee, now STEM math is going to go back to what it ought to be. They're going to use infinitesimals. Well, guess what? I was wrong. Why not? Even today, 
and I'm doing this video in 2021. Our calculus books haven't caught up yet. They still don't use infinitesimals. They're still banned. Why? Well, they don't want to change the books. They've got a huge investment in calculus books, and they don't want to change them. And so there's no infinitesimals today. Now, I use infinitesimals in my online training for calculus because it makes it much easier to understand, much easier, and I use it. Now, the story, though, gets much, much better than that. In fact, the story in, in STEM math gets really interesting in 2009, 21st century, right? 21st century. Okay. The plot thickens. The math education plot thickens. Okay, now in order to understand it, and we've got to talk about what are the ingredients in a good STEM math education program? Well, the student has to learn something called algebra. That are, those are tools you use. Geometry, that's extremely important, of course, because uh, I'm trying to get my thing back up here. Geometry, analytical geometry, which combines calculus or algebra and geometry. Trigonometry, that's angles and trigonometric functions. Then calculus and then differential equations. And all of that has got to be learned if you're going to study science and engineering. This is STEM math. You have to know these subjects, all these subjects you have to know, or you can't do science and engineering. Now, let me tell you what is involved in it. They have something called functions. Now you may have heard of this if you studied any math, you have polynomial functions, you have trigonometric functions, you have exponential functions, you have all their inverses, and you have their composites and all mixed together. So you put all those together and you get a lot of different functions. And those functions are used then as models for something you're studying in science or engineering. <clears throat> you also have something called infinite series. Now these are like infinite polynomials and there's a rigorous definition of them and they're pretty easy to understand heuristically. Then you have, and this is really the big deal, you have math tools that our ancestors developed to analyze functions and to solve STEM math problems. Now, in the 1700s, and 1800s, particularly in the 1700s, they developed a lot of wonderful manual tools. Think of it like carpentry. They developed manual tools for carpentry that let you do all sorts of things with carpentry, but they were manual tools. They're hard to learn, they're hard to use, and they're limited in what they can do, but they developed them. Wonderful. One of the things you want to do, for example, is you want to graph a function, get a picture of it. A graph is a visual picture of a function. That way you can understand it better. Well, if you do it manually, it's very time consuming and very laborious and very difficult. Calculus then is a tool. There's two tools in calculus. There's one called differential, one called integral that you use to study functions. If I give you a function and I ask you to study its behavior, to graph it, you use calculus. That's the tool you use. And there's a lot of manual tools in calculus to do that. And they were developed by Leibniz and Euler and others. Then you have what are called differential equations. Now, you may have heard of algebraic equations where the solution is a number. Well, a differential equation is a model where the solution is a function. Then you take that function and use calculus to study it. This is the workhorse of STEM, differential equations. You cannot understand science and engineering if you don't know differential equations. You must know that. So you got to know the number systems. You got to know what functions are, you've got to know the tools, and you've got to know calculus and differential equations. Now, when that was all done manually, historically, it was very, very difficult. And if you don't know math, you're just hearing a bunch of words, you don't really know what they mean, but you kind of get a concept of it, right? You got algebra, you got a vague idea, you got geometry, you got trigonometry, you got calculus, you got differential equations, you study functions, you got an intuitive idea. I've, I've, I've had parents that, People have looked at the don't know matter. I kind of get the idea of what it's about. Well, here's the problem today. If you're going to study science and engineering, you got to learn all these things if you're a student. And the problem is, I mean, the, the, the facts of the matter are math is the foundation of all STEM subjects. You cannot study science and engineering if you don't know math because it's the language. It's like God's universal language. I like to think of math as God's universal language. You got English and Spanish and Chinese and all that, natural languages. Everybody, math is math. Two plus two equals four. No matter what, the, what your natural language is, your math, in math, it's universal. Now, there's a fundamental problem today with what I call the standard math curriculum that's being taught 
by virtually all of our schools. And it's in all of our math textbooks. It's what our teachers are taught to teach. These wonderful manual tools developed by our ancestors that use basically pencil and paper, something like that, or a chalkboard or whatever, are very difficult to use. They're very difficult to learn. They're very difficult to master. Really a barrier, it's a huge barrier these tools are. And in fact, it's the real main reason many students don't like math. The tools are so hard to use. Like if I tell you to dig a ditch and I say, here's a shovel and here's a pickaxe, and you got to go down and learn to use that thing to dig a ditch. That's not fun. It's hard to learn and it's difficult to do and it's limited what you can do. So it's tough. Now, I don't blame students to get discouraged by the standard math curriculum and the teachers have a hard time teaching it. It's hard to teach that sort of thing. I don't blame them either. It's not the teacher's fault, by the way. It's a systemic problem. You got to deal with numbers and arithmetic calculations and you've got to have all these algorithms to do things. Now, in the case of arithmetic, you know about that. You, you learn to multiply certain algorithms to do it. You learn to add, you learn to divide, you learn to take a square root maybe. Historically, manually, that was hard to do. And so then they developed some tools, manual tools that made it somewhat easier. They developed something called logarithms, which are inverses of what are called exponential functions. And they developed a wonderful tool called a slide rule. When I taught engineering way back in the early 1970s, late 60s and early 70s, we taught them how to use uh, logarithms and trig tables and slide rules to solve arithmetic problems. Very difficult to do. And um, then calculus came along, as I said, in the 1600s, and that's when uh, it was used, the manual tools by Isaac Newton to develop Newtonian physics. And that was a fabulous thing. And then these other manual tools I talked about were developed by Leibniz and Euler, all back in the 16 and 1700s. And having to learn to solve differential equations. Well, anyway, the bottom line is, if you wanted to learn to be a STEM professor, a science or engineer, you had to learn these manual tools and these concepts. The concepts were not very hard to learn, but the tools were terribly difficult to use. It's a great barrier. Now, here's what happened in this 21st century in 2009. Intelligence, as I said, was necessary to, to master the manual tool, but even more was a lot of really hard, drudgery, dedicated work. Math was very tough because of that. It was the manual tools, it was not the concepts that were really the barrier. Well, why am I telling you this? Well, our math programs are still using the manual tools. That's why. Integral calculus, for example, flunks more kids out of engineering school than anything else. Back when I was teaching, I think it still does. They use something called techniques of integration and they're very hard to use. Okay, now th that's the manual tool story. So what happened? There was a miracle in 1972. That was when a miracle number one happened. Hewlett Packard introduced the world's first scientific calculator. It's called the HP 35. It had 35 keys. HP stood for Hewlett Packard. Wow, 1972. Log tables and trig tables and the slide rule were all obsolete overnight. All of a sudden now, science and engineers could do all their arithmetic with a, with a wonderful tool, this calculator. Much easier, much quicker, much less error prone. This was a crisis for math educators. Why was it a crisis? Well, many of their books and courses were obsolete. They taught slide rules. They taught log tables and trig tables. That was hard to learn, by the way. Those, those manual tools were difficult. The calculator was 100 times easier. A lot of teachers I knew back then, professors in particular, got angry over it. They got depressed. Why? Well, that's how they made their living, teaching these manual tools. And all of a sudden, they're gone. They're obsolete. Very difficult. Now, for the professors in engineering schools, this did not affect calculus and differential equations. As I mentioned earlier, these are the workhorses of STEM. Calculus, differential equations. Differential equations set up a model, the solutions of function, calculus, you analyze the function. Still all manual techniques. So that was fine, they could still teach that. 2009, you've heard me mention it before, miracle number two. A massive, educational STEM and math earthquake occurred. 1972, I told you it was the miracle number one scientific calculator, but this is even more spectacular. Now, in order to do that, before I tell you what miracle number two is, 
and, and if you really want to jump ahead, it's some, a tool called Wolfram Alpha. I want to give you the background of it so you understand how this all came about. Because it's extremely, I think, important is how STEM works. You probably know that right after World War II, computers began to be developed. And they were large. Well, in the very beginning, they used vacuum tubes. And then they went to transistors. And they were very large, expensive things. Well, in the 1970s, at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they developed a computer algebra program called Maximum. And it ran on some big computer somewhere. But you could enter various problems from calculus and differential equations and so on, and it could give you solutions, numerical solutions. In the United Kingdom, in England, there was a young man, a teenager named Stephen Wolfram. And somehow he got access to Maxima. I don't know how, but he got access to it. This was before the internet or anything. Somehow he got access to it. And he started using that tool to develop, to solve physics problems, and he published them. And as a teenager, he became pretty famous because he was publishing physics problems where to do the problems manually would have been impossible. He was using this tool Maxima and he could do the problems. So he had this tool that let him do things that otherwise you couldn't do. Well, that was so impressive that he got to go to the greatest physics graduate school in the country, in the world really, Caltech in California. Richard Feynman, the great Nobel laureate physicist was there. Other great physicists were there. And he studied with them using this tool and Wolfram earned his PhD in theoretical physics. I think it was age 20, 1978. I think he was 20 years old, 20 or 21. Immediately, he won the MacArthur Genius Award, a lot of money. What did he want to do? Well, he wanted to do physics, but he wanted a more powerful tool than Maxima. He said, look, I believe that we could create a tool much more powerful than Maxima. I think I know how to do it. And he formed a company and started doing it, and that company failed. Then he started a new research program, and it succeeded. And long story short, it's 10 years now. He was able to introduce a new tool called Mathematica to the world, 1988. Steve Jobs was involved with him and knew about him. And it's an incredible programming language is what it is, a huge programming language tool. Not particularly easy to use, but very powerful. Steve Jobs had left Apple in 1985 and was forming a computer company called The Next Computer, which was going to be more powerful than any of the other computers of the day. I'm talking laptop type computers. And he knew Steve Wolfram, they worked together, and they incorporated this tool, Mathematica, in the next computer. And it was so powerful, very expensive, by the way, as laptop computers went, very cheap compared to big computers. And they bought them over in Chern in Switzerland, and Tim Berners-Lee used Next Computer and Mathematica and developed something you've probably heard of called the World Wide Web. That give you an idea how powerful this tool was, Mathematica? and the next computer, World Wide Web. Uh, we wouldn't have had it if it hadn't been for that tool. That's what he had to use to develop it. He couldn't have done it any other way. Okay, miracle number two comes along. Mathematic gets more and more powerful, more and more powerful, more and more powerful. And by 2009, in fact, by about 2006, Stephen Wolfram thought, you know, I think maybe I can develop a tool that's a program, it's a mathematical program, and this tool will let you solve math problems automatically in ways you can't do it manually, but very efficiently. And he, and, he, and he worked on it, and it turned out he could do that, and he introduced this tool to the world in 2009 called Wolfram Alpha. And it is an incredible, this is miracle number two, and it's a big, big, big deal for math education, for STEM math education in particular. A huge deal. So Mathematica became more and more powerful. And I said 30 years. That was a typographical. It has to be 20 years. Wolfram Alpha was able to create. Steve Wolfram was able to create Wolfram Alpha. That's why it's called Wolfram Alpha. Stephen Wolfram and his company's Wolfram Research created Mathematica. Mathematica is a programming language. And he wrote this huge program. I hear it's 50 million lines of code. I don't know. It runs on a big computer somewhere. I think over in Champaign, Illinois, maybe. And so what happens is it's free. You go to the internet, you put in wolframalpha.com and you ask it a question and boom, it, it does it. Um, I 
didn't I had an example of that. Well, I don't have it now. I think I got rid of it. But in any event, it's very easy to use. It's, it's very easy to use if, well, once you learn how to use it. So Wolfram Alpha is a very sophisticated mathematical program. Now it turns out, and here's the big deal. You can take any calculus problem or differential equation or any kind of other pre-calculus, trigonometry, whatever, and you go to Wolfram Alpha and it will solve it immediately. Wolfram Alpha does for calculus differential equations what the scientific calculator did for arithmetic. Huge. And it does way more than that because there's a lot more math than just calculus differential equations go way beyond that. And Wolfram Alpha does that. It's, amazing. it's a truly amazing thing. So you can take a STEM math problem now and solve it in a minute. That might take you hours to do manually, or maybe you couldn't even do it manually. It's much more revolutionary than the calculator was in my view, because it transforms STEM mathematics. STEM mathematics, starting with calculus, integral calculus in particular, is a great barrier for STEM students. And most of them just to give up, they can't, can't do it. It's like a big tunnel through that barrier. And all of a sudden now, boom, that barrier is gone. Now you can do physics and chemistry and engineering of all types very easily. The math is no longer a barrier. And math is just a tool to do the science. You got to understand that math is a mathematics is a tool to do science. It's a language that you do science in. Well, that was 2009. I had met Steve Wolf from back in 2002. He wrote a book called A New Kind of Science. And I met him when he was on a book tour. <clears throat> I had no idea Wolf from Alpha was going to come along. It did <clears throat> in 2009. So I went to work and I developed a six year math program that it starts off with practical math using just a calculator, a $10 calculator, the TI-30XA, wonderful calculator, $10. And that's practical math. That's tiers one and two. Then I do a little more math for tier three to get you ready for the SAT and the ACT. Still manual tools because they don't allow Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> Those are obsolete tests. Those tests are, in my opinion, horrible. They don't prove anything. but People still have to use them. Well, I did tier three, get it right for that, teach you what manual tools you need to know. Then in tier four, now I'm getting ready for STEM. And right away, I introduced you to Wolfram Alpha. And now we start studying math with Wolfram Alpha. And man, it is amazing. When I developed this program, now I've taught all this math manually many, many times. Because I was a math professor for many years. I have a PhD in math and I've taught this math. When I used Wolfram Alpha, I understood it better. And I enjoyed it more. Because I wasn't, now I wasn't bogged down with the drudgery. And, and it was just wonderful. It's a fantastic thing. And anybody today that, does, that teaches modern math, STEM math, and doesn't use a tool like Wolfram Alpha, and it's the only one I know that's good and free, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's like teaching people to dig a ditch with a pickaxe and a shovel. Wolfram Alpha, to use an analogy, is like a backhoe. Now, you got to learn to use a backhoe. But once you learn to use a backhoe, and it's pretty easy to learn, it doesn't take a lot of physical effort. It takes coordination. It takes knowledge. You have to study it, but it's pretty easy to use. And once you do it, just think, what if you had to go out and dig a long, long ditch today? Would you use a pickaxe and a shovel or would you use a backhoe? And now some people say, well, well I don't have a backhoe. Go, go get one. You ask any contractor today, they got a long ditch. They're not going to pay somebody to go down with a pick and shovel and do it, the labor cost would be horrific if you could even find anybody to do it, they're gonna use a backhoe. Well, the same thing is true of carpentry. Think of a bracing bit for drilling holes. That's what I had to learn when I was a kid, okay? That's hard to do, difficult. Now you take a drill, you take an electric drill with a battery operator, boom, 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 it's just the same thing. So Wolfram Alpha is this phenomenal tool. And I've developed this program now, tiers four, five, and six. Tier five is calculus, tier six is, is differential equations. Another example I use, there are lots of analogies you can use. Uh, Wolfram Alpha is like a modern automobile. The manual tools are like horse and buggy. Okay, you wanna take a trip, 500 mile trip. You can have a horse and buggy, you can have an automobile, which way are you gonna go? Now granted, you gotta learn to drive the automobile. If you never drove an automobile, if all you've ever done is horse and buggies, chances are you're gonna have to learn to use to drive the automobile. That's something different, right? And all that knowledge you had for horse and buggy didn't go do any good. <clears throat> not really, not very much good at all. And that's what we're doing in our math today. We're teaching kids today 
the manual tools were like horse and buggy tools. They're never going to use them. They're hard to learn. And we're not teaching them the modern tool like a modern automobile, which is what they're going to use. That's what's happening today in STEM math, in our schools. And it's all because it's happened so fast. 2009, that's a little over a decade ago. None of the books today do this. Uh, you're not going to find all the calculus books today, all the high school math textbooks, they're obsolete. Every one of them. Calculus books are obsolete. Difference equation books. Why? They all, all they teach is the manual tools. Now, they were wonderful in their day, but they're not now. Now, if you're going to learn Wolfram Alpha and you're going to learn all these things, I've got this six tier program that I tell you about on other videos that you go to go watch. It's in the book. You can even, if you, if you get this book, which for free, in the back of it, I've got the, uh, I, I think I've got it. Well, somewhere in the book, I've got a layout of the, uh, or I'll show you where you can go get the, um, the syllabus for the six tiers. And we use something called spike pedagogy, which you need to learn about. It's in the book, which is the way to teach math. It's self-paced, proper content, interactivity, keeping score, and empathy, all easy and inexpensive. Another, another example I use, this is an analogy. Think of a smartphone today compared to an old landline phone. In fact, a smartphone is a bad name. A smartphone is much more than a phone, right? If you use a smartphone like I do, and I'm an old guy, but I use a smartphone all the time, I use it all the time. I, I get information from it. I keep my calendar on it. I do all sorts of things with it. I, I could, I'd hate to be without it. Now, I make phone calls. That's fine. And by the way, they're, they're free now. It used to be expensive to make phone calls. Now it's cheap. Just compare a smartphone to a landline phone. Compare Wolfram Alpha to what's being taught in schools today. That's a comparison. And I gave another, in the book, I gave an example of a, of a hole, whether you use a brace a bit or whatever. I won't go over that now in, in this video. You can read this and the think if you want to. But the bottom line is manual tools for calculus and differential equations and other subjects, trigonometry, algebra, and so on. It's obsolete. The new tool gets rid of the barrier. They're no longer a barrier to learning STEM math. They're no longer a barrier. 21st century math programs are vastly superior to 20th century where you didn't have the tool. By the way, a lot of homeschoolers today are buying the program, the tiers one through tier six. They love it. Rave reviews. Students that were struggling with math, didn't like math, love math now. That's because of spike pedagogy, frankly, and because I'm teaching practical math in the beginning. Well, we, we're going to have this uh, STEM math club the schools can have. And if you're watching this video, you're probably on um, on that on that website because this is this is where I'm making this video for the Dr. Dell Club STEM Math Club. So if, if you don't know about it, you need to go to STEM Math Made Easy. And uh, if you go there to STEM Math Made Easy, that's a not for profit corporation. We have a new thing called Dr. Dell, that's me, STEM Math Club. And you go and join that. And, and, and this is for schools now, primarily for private schools, probably mostly for Christian schools. That's why I call it golden rule math. I teach math the way I would want to be taught math, knowing what I know today. If I were a student, this is the way I'd want to be taught. That's the golden rule, right? Doing to others. And so that's what I have. Now, I wanted to tell you about that. It's kind of a ramble in a way. And you may have to watch it two or three times or just get the book and read the chapter. And, and get it and, and then and then whatever, if you're involved with educating students that might be interested in STEM, even, especially the ones that are afraid of math, this book you must read and you need to get them enrolled in a STEM math club somewhere. A lot of schools today, I believe are going to have STEM math clubs in their school. If you're going to such a school, you need to enroll in. By the way, if you're a homeschooler, you're already getting all the things that the, that the club gets because you're getting my six tier program, but that's another story. This is really aimed at really at schools, primarily at conservative schools, Christian schools, for example, that believe in giving your student the best you can give them and doing what the golden rule would dictate. So that's what this is all about. I, uh, I appreciate you watching this video. I know it's been pretty long and it's kind of a rant and a rave and I'm excited about it. I'm thrilled about it. Um, it's because of Stephen Wolfram that this is the, the analogy I use, by the way, I was talking to someone today about it is a David and Goliath story. David had a sling with a rock that was the equivalent of a modern pistol. 
and Goliath just had the old Bronze Age tools, a sword and a, a shield and all that. And when David went out on the field, the soldiers of that day were Bronze Age soldiers, and they used the kind of uh, equipment Goliath did. <clears throat> David had the equivalent of a modern tool. The sling was like a modern pistol. They've proven that in Israel, and he was skilled at it because he was a shepherd, and he had learned to go out and use the sling to defend the flock. So when he went down to meet with Goliath, today the analogy would be you got a, a big, strong person that's a great fighter standing there maybe with a club and you got a kid standing back here that knows how to shoot a 45 pistol 50 feet away. Who's going to win the fight? Boom. Done. Well, this is what this is like. Wolfram alpha is like the sling, the modern weapon tool that David had and the standard math curriculum with Goliath. It's everywhere. It's all the textbooks, all the schools are teaching it. So it's, it's David, it's a David versus Goliath story. I, I kind of like that analogy. Anyway, enough of that. You've heard a lot of that. I encourage you to definitely um, learn more about this and get involved either if you're not either in homeschooling, which you can do it easily then if you're a homeschooler, or if you're a, a school, like a Christian school, start a STEM math club, which will then augment your current math program and really get everybody to using this modern tool and then your school will be offering so much more than any school that does not offer it, okay? You'll be way ahead of the game. So this is Craig Hainer, Dr. Dell. Thanks for watching the video. I wish you the best in your future life. If you do the right things, pray to God, do the right things. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful life and you'll certainly solve the STEM math problem. So I'll see you later. Okay, bye-bye.